imagine when you are in crisis, you have a cold or even a trauma or injury or something. And these days when you go to an emergency room, you have to wait four, five hours, maybe half a day or whatever it is, right? But when you are at home at your own comfort and when you do have some of the essential remedies that you can actually immediately use, that's much more of a help than really rushing to the hospital and waiting all that time to be able to be seen by somebody. So it's actually better to be the own seer and to be able to produce the home remedies that can serve even those crisis events that we sometimes go through. So we are really going to explore that and we are going to claim back our right to heal ourselves because that's a basic human right. We've heard about food and shelter and companion and love and all this, but I think I should add this as a basic human right, that we have the right to know ourselves and to heal ourselves. And we have to take back that right from the people who we have entrusted our care the doctors and the practitioners and this and that, right? Because they can't know us better than we do know ourselves. So welcome on that journey to uh, begin this kind of um, self-treatment. So um, if we use nature as the healing power, you can see that uh, there is actually a state of dynamic balance. Because if you see at the plants, we go through years and times change and we go through hardship and we grow up and sometimes it doesn't go as well for us and so forth. But when you look out there at the plants and the trees and everything else, they have immense ability to adapt. They always survive in the environment no matter what. They have really this pronounced and probably accentuated will to live and survive through various conditions. So when we use plants, we are actually experiencing ourselves that healing energy, that adaptability that is actually inherent in that plant uh, kingdom. So when we use herbal medicines for healing, we do use chemical compounds. And we know that a lot of the traditional medicines come from herbs, right? But also a lot of the pharmaceuticals these days come from herbal medicines. Um, aspirin and morphine and um, digitalis and coumadin and all these have been actually derived from plant sources. And uh, the reason why the pharmaceutical companies don't use the plant material anymore is that it's bulk, it's very messy, right? They would have to uh, receive truckloads of plant material and process that, and it's much easier for them to actually use chemicals to do the same. But we are really using the same chemical compounds that are already in plants. They would have to isolate them from plants, and that's not that convenient anymore. So therefore, they actually reach for the chemical constituents themselves, and they use petroleum products, and they use basic chemicals that are already available now to put them together and to create that same kind of compound. But really what the basis of that is, is really the and all the medicines that we see today have been derived from that plant and sometimes chemically changed a little bit so that they work a little bit more. So there is a little bit of a tale of atoms that are added or subtracted or whatever, but it's basically essentially a herbal remedy that you are even being prescribed by the doctor. So the true nature of herbs is chemical, but it's also this energetic kind of essence that herbs actually hold that, uh, that can balance us as well. So uh, they can actually realign and reconnect our systems with both our individual nature and the universal truth because they have so well adapted 
to living on the earth and they don't complain about that. They just know what to do and they bring us the joy and uh, all the useful substances that we use and uh, all that that uh, we can benefit from. So that's, that's the nice thing about uh, using herbs that uh, you're actually using the whole plant for a whole human being. You're not using just a part of something, you are not using a chemical compound, but you are actually using the whole plant. And that means that it actually does have the ability to balance. So when you are drinking herbal tea, you can imagine what actually went into that. And I make our own herbal teas and when, when I mix the rose petals and the calendula flowers and the lavender and everything, it feels quite empowering actually and joyful at the same time because you are really using things that you resonate with. And I am going to be showing you some of those uh, things that I make. So these are infused calendula flowers. We can start passing some of these around because we may not have uh, time at the end to actually talk about everything. So you can already have something in your hand and look at it and, uh, and see what goes into that. But it's all extremely simple. Here are my favorite plants actually. So this is dandelion there very useful and I'm glad that we actually passed the bylaws that allow us to cultivate dandelions on our lawns now because they are pretty useful and they look very pretty as well and of course they attract pollinators. And uh, here is another one, you probably recognize Echnesia. It's a very uh, powerful and very well known home um, cold remedy that uh, if you take that at the right time can actually significantly reduce the length of recovery from um, cold because it stimulates the immune system but a lot of people take it as an adaptogen too which means uh, that it can actually help you to adapt to stress and it can help you to uh, cleanse the system on a very gentle pace so that you don't experience any of those side effects of detoxification, the headache and the foggy mind and the unwell stomach and so forth that people sometimes experience when they detox. So you can start looking at the recipes and my first um, topic today is actually nature's laxatives, what to do at the time when we don't feel very well and uh, actually it's quite amazing that uh, non-prescription medications that people most buy, uh, most of them are actually laxatives. There are painkillers that uh, are on the list as well, but a lot of people need to reach for some sort of laxative in their lives because we live a very unnatural lifestyle. And uh, I would need to remind you here that the human body, the same as the plant body, has an adaptability encoded in our DNA. The problem is that we adapt much slower to changes. So our physiology has not really changed much in the last thousand years or so, right? And therefore, when we live this very unnatural lifestyle that wasn't seen before, we actually pay the price for it. So when you compare our diet with the diet that people ate maybe 200 years ago even, and uh, of course uh, be much before that as well, it was much higher in fiber, for instance. So they would consume on an average 45 to 60 grams of fiber a day. And the average North American actually consumes 11. So you can see that it's five times, sometimes five times less. And at the same time, we don't move very much. We don't actually use the core muscles. 
And these days, people figured out that we have to strengthen the core muscles. So there's a lot of core exercises recommended, right? And everybody is doing them. And that's an excellent recommendation because if there is a lot of stagnation in that area, of course, the muscles get flabby and tired and sluggish. And we can't really achieve that kind of bulk movement that the large intestine is supposed to achieve at least once a day. And a lot of people ex experience that and suffer from that discomfort of accumulation. And when you look at Dr. Jensen's book and see those things that can actually accumulate in our colon over time, it's pretty appalling actually what happens. And unfortunately, a lot of people are thousand meals behind or at least hundreds meals behind, right, uh, in the elimination. So it's a real problem. So how do we fix it? I was talking about the fiber already, so that's one of the ways. And the high fiber foods that you can actually use are these. So, of course, fruits and vegetables are very high in fiber. So load up on those. Dried fruit is excellent. You have the dates there. Dried fruit is excellent for fiber, as long as you have enough water in your diet as well. Because dried fruit are dried fruit, right? They've been dehydrated. That means that they lost the natural water content. So to be able to eat that again, uh, without imbalance, we have to add the water in our regime, in our uh, daily routine. Um, another very successful home remedy to constipation is flaxseed that you have right uh, on the lower left there. Uh, flax seeds are excellent for their fiber and also mucilage. If you've ever worked with flax seed, you know that when you soak it in water, it becomes gel. And that's exactly that kind of gel that we need in our large intestine to provide the bulk and to provide a smooth kind of consistency so that we can easily pass the residues. So flaxseed is very valuable for its fiber. A lot of the laxatives that you can buy in a drugstore they do two things. One thing is that they irritate the colon so that it feels that it needs to expel the contents. And that constant <coughs> irritation of the laxative actually makes matters even worse because your muscles become tired and sluggish, therefore. So you will need more of that effect to achieve the same thing. And a lot of people do experience that, that they have to actually take more, and this is not working for them anymore, so they have to change to something else, and it's a perpetual problem. And uh, the second thing that can actually happen with those um, over-the-counter laxative is they imbalance the electrolyte balance in the body because they work on osmotic um, principle and that means that uh, they draw actually liquids out of the system so you get even more dehydrated and again in the long run that too can actually worsen the symptoms. So you don't want to go that route when you start on something and then you have to increase and increase and increase the dose and the problem is not fixed. So we are not really healing the problem. We are just treating the symptoms. And we have to really understand that there is a crucial difference between these two approaches. When we approach something in a systematic way that we just treat the symptoms, but we can also heal the system as a whole so that we bring it back to balance. And all those remedies I'm going to talk about are actually designed to heal. So the flax Beautiful mucilage and uh, excellent fiber. It's also anti-cancer. There are lignans in flax that are anti-cancer substances. 
and if you grind your flax and if you eat it that way or if you have flax oil as well, that's not going to help the constipation problem, flax oil, but it's going to bring the essential fatty acids into the system and essential fatty acids also keep um, the muscles strong and the cell membranes strong so that over time you can actually increase the vitality of the whole body. So that's a very valuable actually remedy for uh, constipation. So I can start passing the, the gem around so you can take a little bit of that. From that little bit that you are going to put on, you don't have to uh, worry about that. Okay, so uh, <laughs> we do have washrooms here, but uh, perhaps we have a bigger crowd than we normally have in school. So um, just uh, just tiny little taste of that and take the whole thing and just take one, yeah, and pass it all together to the next person. Okay, so so that you can actually taste it because it's, it's quite yummy, uh, what you can actually create in your own kitchen. Um, then on the lower middle, I have aloe vera plant, and um, that's a sort of first aid plant that you can actually keep in your house, but the aloe juice and uh, a lot of the West Indies stores actually sell those huge aloe leaves that you can juice and you can use the aloe because aloe is really bitter. And also, it has that gel that, um, that helps the tone of the muscle. And also, the bitter principle is excellent as a laxative measure because all bitters stimulate the flow of bile out of the liver. And when bile starts flowing out of the liver, bile is actually a natural laxative. And it helps us to remove toxins from the system because a lot of times in the liver we transform toxins into the form that can be excreted and when we have enough bile that actually works as a lubricant but also as a, a laxative that can actually help us to remove residues again from the system. So all bitters are excellent. So I showed you the dandelion. Dandelion root is also very good as a bitter and uh, the leaves can be also consumed as a vegetable. So bitter taste is actually very valuable for the whole digestive system because as you experience bitter taste and perhaps you experience that at the beginning of the meal and that's why bitters traditionally are used at the beginning of the meal so that we can stimulate the digestion, we can send the message into the digestive system that food is coming and all the juices need to start flowing and we have to prepare the system uh, for receiving food but also for eliminating the residue. So if you use bitters, we actually experience both. We prepare the organism for receiving food, but we also prepare for uh, elimination. So that's, that's nice to realize. But um, on the right, I have all kinds of beans. So when you look at the chart that shows you the fiber content of different foods, you are going to see single digits for fruits and vegetables for a serving. But when you start looking into legumes, you will see double digits. And we remember we have to get to that 30 to 45 grams. So if you eat a cup of beans and that gives you 16 grams of fiber, that's pretty good. So all legumes are excellent fiber sources. And there is that soluble fiber in them that actually helps us um, to um, conjugate or trap the toxins and eliminate them. And there is also insoluble fiber that works as a brush, so to speak, for the intestine to clean the intestine. So all of those, both of those kinds of fiber are actually very good. And if constipation is a chronic problem, there are two things that an uh, individual can do. I have a recipe for morning laxative here, which, in as, which is an excellent way to start your day. 
if you have not eliminated because the easiest time to eliminate is in the morning first thing in the morning if you can get your body to that habit it's just beautiful because then you feel so to speak clean for the day so before you start anything else it's a good idea to to eliminate the residues of yesterday right we sort of cleanse our mind in our sleep we prepare for the new day so we wake up fresh we wake up refreshed we say right and we are ready to start the new day but we should also take care of the body so the body can also feel refreshed and elimination of residues is one of the best ways to actually feel refreshed so if that hasn't happened drinking very hot water with some salt and lemon juice can actually achieve that why do we put the salt in see this is not water that we drink to hydrate our body with this is water that we flush out our system with so it needs to have the salt to stay in the intestines and not to be absorbed by the body right so this hot water with the salt in it is going to actually remain in the digestive system and travel through the digestive system and accomplish that uh, stimulation so that we can eliminate the residues. Yes? Does it matter what kind of salt? Sea salt. Sea salt is good. I like working with the Himalayan rock salt because it's pure, it's, it's uh, crystallized uh, a long time ago, so it doesn't have the toxins of the modern uh, ocean that we have uh, in the sea salt. So perhaps the Himalayan rock salt is one of the best sources of salt. So it's the pink salt and it would be on an empty stomach first thing in the morning if you have this chronic problem with constipation or if you want to retrain your body so that you can accomplish that elimination first thing in the morning. So that's one thing that people can do. And the other thing that people can use is a very traditional Ayurvedic medicine called Trifala and I am showing you the product here actually or one of the products because there are a lot of different kinds that you can buy but I believe that sometimes what you can buy cheap is not necessarily the pure thing right so it's a good idea to get it from a reputable source so there are now some organic Ayurvedic lines which is quite nice and uh, one of them is the organic traditions. So they have trifala powder. And trifala is actually a combination of three different herbs. We don't have to talk about that. But we can talk about how it's used. So you will actually use it before bed. So you can put half a teaspoon of that triple powder in very hot water and brew it as tea, let it steep for five minutes, and then you can drink that as tea. And that's going to help you overnight to actually um, condition the colon so that you can eliminate first thing in the morning. And if you have really chronic constipation, you will repeat that first thing in the morning. So instead of that hot water, you can actually use the trifala and you can drink that and you will drink that then twice a day. And that should over time actually remedy the problem. Trifala is also a tonic. So it's not just a laxative, but it's also a tonic. So it's going to help the muscle strength and tone and it's going to be a tonic for the whole system because there's also lots of vitamin C in it. Yes? Are there any contraindications with using that with the pharmaceutical? No, absolutely not. These are all very safe, gentle approaches that you don't have to worry about contraindications at all. So, um, so that's, that's another one that can be used very safely. And uh, of course, throughout the day, you can sip hot water. 
that's also a very very good recommendation just very simply get a thermos and fill it with hot water it can have the lemon juice and a little bit of salt if you want but it doesn't have to tea is also good but a lot of teas that we drink are diuretic that means that you're losing a lot of water from your system and that can be sometimes counterproductive as well because if you lose a lot of water you need a really good lubrication in your digestive system so that may not be the best so just the hot water is perfect you can in the winter put a little bit of cayenne in it for the warming effect or it can be ginger any of those are excellent to warm up the system so those would be really good gentle approaches yes is, uh, is warm water actually better for you than uh, cold water on a traditional basis or yes it's always better at least warm water because cold water really shuts down the <coughs> stomach area right and it can interfere with digestion see people drink cold water when for weight loss so they don't feel hungry because you really sort of shut down the digestive process but if you drink cold water and you are trying to accomplish to digest something or you know nourish and so forth it's actually not the best idea and it also shuts down the lungs because lungs are so close to the stomach so it can actually trap toxins in the lungs as well and we live in a polluted area so everything we can do to actually expel toxins is much better so warm or even hot water in this case is always better thank you so I also have a recipe for digestive cordial so this is for connoisseurs here who really want to bring it to a next level and I didn't bring any sample here because if I did we wouldn't have space for all the students who would be uh, rushing into the school so <laughs> you have to trust me that it's a very delicious digestive remedy it has a little bit of honey and lots of digestive spices so if you look through the recipe you're going to see here ginger ginger is one of the best digestive stimulants it's what we call is a sialagogue which means that it stimulates the flow of saliva so when you eat a slice of ginger before a meal you feel the flow of saliva right in and there's actually a nice again ayurvedic condiment that you can make with ginger and a little bit of salt and some lemon juice and you can eat that before meals to stimulate digestion it has all the taste it really balances uh, you it refreshes the palate right so that you can taste the taste of your food so all those are really good qualities so it's just grated ginger lemon juice and a little bit of rock salt mixed together and you can use that as a digestive condiment before meals so ginger is one of the primary digestive spices so um, ginger is on our list dill seed is another one dill seed is primary a carminative carminative means that it actually reduces the gas in our digestive system so when we feel a little gassy after we have eaten something a lot of people when they change the diet and when they start introducing legumes and lots of vegetables in their diet they experience gas in the digestive system because you are actually retraining your system and there will be different bacteria colonizing your system and those bacteria can actually give off some of the gases that then you know trouble us so uh, uh, carminatives are very useful for that effect to eliminate gassiness in the system fennel seed is the same usually dill seed and fennel seed would be used together anise as well and spices we bruise lightly with mortar and pestle and then you can soak them in vodka so buy some vodka yeah and mortar and pestle those are this it's, it's a little bowl 
with, uh, with a pounder in it. And um, so you are pounding the seeds down, yeah, so that you bruise them a little bit. You can grind them as well, and then you can soak all that in vodka, in a cup of vodka. Any clear 40% alcohol, you can get pure alcohol. In, a, in the United States, you can buy pure alcohol here, 90% uh, or more. Mm -hmm. Here you can't unless you have a special license. So I don't actually bother recommending that because it's a hassle to buy a license to own strong alcohol. So you can just work with vodka, it works great. What she's trying to ask is without alcohol. Without alcohol? Um, well, you can, but this is almost like a tincture. A tincture is a remedy that is always made with alcohol. Alcohol actually extracts much better the chemical constituents out of herbs and especially those seeds. So if you do that with alcohol, you actually extract more of the chemical constituents than you would just with water. So it's a better idea to actually extract with alcohol and professionally when you use herbal tinctures they actually wor work very well because you can use less of the plant material and um, get more of the benefit. So sometimes we use herbal teas but sometimes it's actually useful to use alcohol to extract the chemical, con chemical constituents from plants. So in this case because we are making this very special kind of aperitive kind of drink, we are actually using the alcohol. And uh, there's also honey, so it's sort of a sweet kind of um, appetite stimulant that you can um, drink before meals or sometimes after. You can also use it as an energizing and warming elixir as I have here because it does have a lot of warming spices in it so in the winter if you feel a little bit cold you have just that on a, on a tip of a spoon it's in instantaneously going to warm you up because it has a little bit of alcohol in there and a little bit of honey honey is also warming and all those spices that also have warm qualities to them so all this is excellent um, in combination. And I actually put additional digestive herbs and spices here. So um, the first one on the list is Ajwan. And people don't usually know this one. It's a little obscure kind of thing. But I have it here for you because uh, this is an invaluable remedy for poor digestion. It's just like getting acquainted with a person. You sort of wanna, and we work with pheromones, right? We humans actually are attracted to human smell. They have to actually have documented that, that we are more attracted to that than perhaps the visual. It's quite interesting frightening perhaps sometimes <laughs> but it's true so you can do that first and then you put few of them on your hand and then you can uh, put them in your mouth and swish them in your mouth you don't even have to chew them it's sometimes better not to because they can be a little bit too strong your stomach is going to do the rest of the job so you don't have to do it with your teeth if you don't want to so i can Pass that this way. Yes. I think I have poor digestion. Does that mean when your nutrients aren't absorbing properly? Mm -hmm. Is that how you would define uh, poor digestion? Yes, mean? definitely. Oh. Definitely. Because first, what you want to do first for poor digestion is you want to cultivate the secretion of the digestive juices in the system. Because that's how digestion the system is achieved. How do you know? There are all kinds of different symptoms. When you go through the symptomatology uh, questionnaire and you answer your questions about the state of your hair and your skin and your nails and your whole body 
and of course the feeling of tiredness and uh, uh, poor immunity and all those things would probably come into place when we experience poor digestion because digestion is really one of the primary functions of the human body the human body will sacrifice even the immune function to digestion when there is food to be digested all the energy is diverted to that digestive process and we sometimes even you know sacrifice some of the other functions to that one because it's a primary one for the human body to maintain itself repair itself and grow and uh, survive and so forth right so cultivating of the digestive power is one of the best ways to overcome any kind of disease so it becomes very very simple when you look at it right just improving the digestive system and the digestive power we actually in Ayurveda call it Agni fire digestive fire right it's just like putting fuel in the fire right feeding the fire to getting energy out of that the way the human body gets energy is through the digestive system we don't have fire burning in us it would burn us right we have other kind of fire though we've got the digestive juices which is the equivalent of fire so that's our fire so cultivating that fire keeping that fire going strong that's one of the best ways to overcome any kind of health issue yes is this easy to obtain the Ajwan? Yeah. Yes. And you just have to go, no. They don't know that secret yet. Mm -hmm. I don't know why they have not caught on, but you can't get it in a health food store. You have to go to an East Indian store oh. to obtain Ajwan. Mm -hmm. There is one here at uh, Thorncliff Park. There's a little strip mall there. And there are a few Indian stores in there. Or you can make a visit to Little India. <laughs> Diwali has passed, unfortunately, but last week it was very busy with all the Diwali celebrations. But it's always a fun trip because this time of the year, I think they make uh, fresh cane juice. You can experience the taste of fresh cane juice when the cane stick actually goes into the machine and then you get the juice and put a little bit of lemon juice in there and it's a really nice drink without the effect of sugar, right? Because people who drink raw cane juice have no dental cavities and no issues with diabetes and whatnot, right? That's when we start processing and refining the cane juice. That's when we start getting into the, all, all these problems. Indian village, Gerard and Absolutely, yes, yes, yes. There are a lot of places where you can obtain those Ayurvedic or Indian spices. Tuna's herbalist. Tuna's herbalist as well, yeah. So Ajwan, you can get, but only in those special stores. Health food stores don't have it yet, but um, I'm sure it's coming because they're catching on. So people who have eaten that, how does it feel? Wow, it tastes like a nest that looks like mm -hmm. That's right, yeah, it feels quite amazing, right? And when it goes down into the stomach, you instantaneously feel the warmth. Unbelievable, what you actually get from that tiny little seed. Yes, okay, question Sorry. there? Yes, he said um, to take it before a meal and when else? Even after. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, like if you already feel a little bit uh, unwell, <laughs> right, and gassy, yeah. this actually helps almost instantaneously. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, sorry, I was on. Uh, I actually uh, chewed a seed, and mm -hmm. it got to a point where it was really hot. Yes, mm -hmm. that's right. And yes, I, I felt it in my mouth. Mm -hmm. down, so. Yeah, yeah, it feels very pleasant. Mm -hmm. I actually have a little container when you use, when you need a fresh uh, breath freshener. Right? You chew a few of those seeds and you are covered, right? A lot of people ask me what I recommend as chewing gum substitute. Something like that, right? Or cardamom or something that refreshes your mouth as well. Yes? Um, could you use this in a, in a tincture? Like, could, you make it in could you make a tincture out of it? Sure. Okay. 
Yeah, absolutely. And then, of course, you will make sort of like a professional digestive formula. You can even include it in the digestive cordial. And you can make that cordial without the honey as a tincture only. And you can use that as digestive aid as well. So all that is possible. You can sort of play with that. And all you need is mordant pestle and vodka. Everybody can obtain that, right? Easy. Yes. So for the digestive cordial that you were making, if you make it without the honey, how long would it last for? And like, how do you for a it? long time. How do you store it? They found some tinctures from the Middle Ages, from the Franciscans, yeah. and they were as good as new. So tinctures, when they are unopened, last for centuries. Just yes. On the counters? Absolutely, yes. It's better to put it in dark cupboard. You don't want to expose it to light too much. For the first week after making it, shake it every day and then leave it alone. Store it in a dark cupboard. Somewhere where you can see it so that you get inspired to use it. <laughs> don't stash it away. Okay. So let's go on. So these are all the digestive uh, suggestions. And as I said, cultivating the digestion is one of the best and surest ways to overcome any kind of disease. Even when you are battling cold, what, we, what do we do? We brew ginger tea. So well, that does two things. It warms you up. It speeds up the processes in the body but it also clears toxins from the digestive system so that the body can feel free to battle with the viruses and bacteria and whatever there is that is invading our body. So we still work on the digestive system. And sometimes for cold, it's better to fast, as we know, right? So just with that ginger tea with a little bit of honey, honey is also warming and you get a little bit of uh, carbohydrate in the system, energy for your body, right? But not too much for the digestive system to be burdened with. So you can actually detox a little bit and you can get over your cold very, very quickly. Well, if you experience um, very um, annoying kind of cough that uh, you can't sleep at night for, because of that, then there are some homeopathics remedies and some cold remedies, of course. But one of the best ways to uh, do something at home is put an onion in honey, chop an onion and soak it in honey and use that syrup. You're going to be very surprised how pleasant that tastes and how effective it actually is, especially for cough, but also for cold. If it's cold, you can actually add cloves and ginger and that formulation is then going to be for both cough and cold. So all you need to do here is chop up the onion and uh, put honey over to cover the onion and then you let it stand on the counter for at least six hours and then you consume the syrup. If you don't want to strain it, just, you know, just put the spoon in there and avoid the onion and just take the syrup out and when you get to almost nothing there, then you probably have to squeeze it out in a cheesecloth or something, but you don't even have to. And you can use the residual plant material, the onion in your soup or something, I wouldn't waste it. So it's one of the best cough syrups. And of course, at that time, we need to consume lots of vitamin C and natural sources of vitamin C would be best. So rosehip tea, for instance, is an excellent source of vitamin C. It's also pleasant to use this syrup with children because they like it tastes sweet and just, just a little bit spicy, but it doesn't usually bother them, so they usually like it.
So then we have this basic healing calendula salve. So what was passing on here in um, this mason jar, those were soaked calendula flowers. So for this, it doesn't get as easy as just making it tomorrow because you probably need to grow the calendula flowers. So a little bit of planning is probably required, but you can always obtain calendula. Not as beautiful as this, unfortunately, because whatever you get in a herbal store or in a health food store doesn't usually look as fresh as what you can actually do yourself. So you can grow calendula and um, here are the flowers. So this is how you collect them. And you probably know Calendula officinalis. That's the official name for that. And officinalis tells us that it's been used for centuries again by herbalists. So it's a very valuable antifungal, antiviral, antimicrobial, and uh, it's also very good for healing. It has very good healing properties. So when you make that salve, that can be used on s bruises and minor cuts and scrapes and blemishes and so forth. So it's a very useful... How about insect bites? Insect bites as well, yes. So it's a very useful preparation, actually. I have a handout Thank for you. you. Uh, so you can actually soak those calendula flowers in olive oil or grapeseed oil, if you prefer that, or uh, green tea oil. They now started to extract uh, oil from the seeds of the tea plant. So that's also available. That extracts quite well, but just regular olive oil is fine. So any good um, edible quality oil is, uh, is good for that. So you will want to soak them just like that in a mason jar or a jar with a glass <coughs> lid. And if you have the dry flowers, you soak them for at least two weeks. And it's good if the temperature is warmish for that. So if you uh, put it close to a heat vent or uh, on the stove where you normally cook and it usually keeps warm, something like that is nice because that warm temperature actually is going to speed up the extraction of the constituents in, into the oil. And your, the color of the oil is going to change. The oil at the end of the extraction <coughs> time is going to look sort of orange. So it will have picked up the essences from the plants, including the color. So that's how you know that your oil is ready. And then you um, strain the oil through a metal sieve, if you have one, and you work with the oil to make your salve. So the oil itself can be useful already you can use it for massage and um, as oil for your facial treatment or um, a whole body um, treatment, and that's all right. But if you want to have it in a salve, then you also need to include beeswax in your recipe. So you have to get beeswax um, at a farm or um, a health food store. Actually, they, they have those beeswax sticks or if you don't have anything, you can just uh, get a tea light candle of beeswax or just, just the beeswax candle in a health food store and just, uh, just take out the wick and use the beeswax, right? So that's quite available. And I have the recipe here for you. So, um, so what you want to have is um, for eight ounces or one cup of the calendula oil, you need two ounces beeswax which is about quarter cup or one of the tea light candles. So that's easy to obtain. And if you want to work with essential oil, you can also include some. So you are going to melt all that together. And um, what you can use for that is either hot water bath. So you have a pot um, 
with boiling water and you immerse that measuring cup, glass measuring cup, with those ingredients in there and you mix it until it all dissolves, right? Very easy. And then you have nice cream. So, um, so I have that here as well. So I don't know if the sticks are still around. Yeah, they are here. So if you want to put that on your hands or whatever you want to do with that, that um, is possible. Okay, so this is the ready calendula salve. And that, of course, can be used for the skin. But if you want to, in the time of need for cold, a chest rub or something, you can actually add essential oil to that. So you can mix in eucalyptus oil, for instance, or thyme oil, or peppermint oil, or any of those oils that have antibacterial properties, and they also clear out the sinuses. So you can add that, and especially for children, again, it's very pleasant to apply that on the chest and leave it there for the night. So if you go to make a rub for chest congestion, that's the third page right on top, stir in the essential oils of eucalyptus, oregano, sandalwood, lemon, clove, thyme, pine, cedarwood, cypress, or peppermint. So all of these are very good antibacterial oils that can be used for colds and congestion. So you would just choose one? You just choose one or a combination. Yeah, any of that is fine. Yeah. So, so that's the basic cream and what you can actually do with it. So again, making your own cosmetics, that's the next step. Turning your kitchen into a beauty um, supply manufacturer. So um, what you can also do with those essential oils, we have an example of that here. And that's something that I actually did here. I guess it sort of expired on us, but I had hot water on the plate and I put essential oil in there. So when you entered the room, you smelled that nice uh, um, sort of cedar, pine, sandalwood smell, right? So my blend is called Sacred Mountain and it does have cedar, pine, sandalwood, and lang lang. And it's a nice combination that is actually quite pleasant. And if you are looking for an alternative to a conventional um, perfume, you can actually use essential oils for that without the effects on the brain that actually the chemicals that they use have. So using pure essential oils actually have been shown to have the opposite effect. So instead of the chemicals causing brain fog, and uh, toxicity, the pure essential oils actually elevate the mind and they stimulate the neurons and they make you uh, learn better. Actually, in ancient Greece, the scholars and the students would wear a crown of rosemary. And it wasn't just so that they wanted to make themselves pretty, but it was actually to enhance the learning ability, the brain activity. So they actually knew what they were doing. And the laurel wreath that people receive, that also is um, very fragrant, right? So the scents and the fragrances actually were to celebrate our capacities, our capabilities, and enhance them as well. Because rosemary is one of the brain stimulating oils, actually. It's one of the stimulating, not relaxing, but more stimulating oils. So that's, that's how we know historically that actually uh, essential oils were used for various practical purposes. So what you can do for colds, you brew a lot of chamomile tea, hot chamomile tea. So you, you take a pan with a very wide um, bottom and uh, maybe a liter of water, um, boil it all up and uh, add a few tea bags of chamomile or a handful of chamomile flowers and let that steep. But immediately into that boiled tea concoction, you put essential oils. 
Eucalyptus works great, of course, but you can use thyme, and you can use any of these that I mentioned here, and you can put yourself over that steam with a towel over, or it can be a heavy coat or a heavy blanket, whatever is available, and then you, you stay in that environment for 10, 15 minutes, or as long as it's comfortable. And it's going to be very effective for a relieving of congestion in the chest. So that's exactly what you need to do. You just um, bend yourself over that, make yourself comfortable, and stay in that tent. And again, it's very useful for children because they like that adventure. <laughs> they like being hidden there under that cloak. Right? So you can actually make it fun for them. Yeah, and it's all about that. Right? So I do have the oil of eucalyptus here, but I'm sure everybody has smelled that before. But if you want to have a little reminder, you can pass that around as well. Um, these ones come from Young Living. So that's a very good source, but uh, health food stores have quite a few different lines available. I usually go by the smell <coughs> because the good, pure essential oils really smell very uplifting. You don't really smell any kind of chemical in there. Because if you are sensitive and if you are sort of trained a little bit, you can detect if the essential oil has been adulterated or cut with some chemical substances. And unfortunately, a lot of products, a lot of perfumes, a lot of cosmetics have those fake fragrances in them, right? But it's really easy to detect them if you sort of trained yourself to do so. Now, uh, the next oil that I also have an example for you here is St. John's Wort Oil. So those are the other plants that we use for that Hypericum perforatum. Uh, is the Latin name for St. John's wort. And uh, it's a wild flower that um, begins flowering around St. John's wort time. I, I mean, St. John's time, right? So that's around uh, late July or June to late July. That's the window for St. John's wort flowers. And what you want to do, you want to collect the flowering tops. And you are going to see that if you bruise them in your fingers, you get red juice coming out. So that's how you can recognize that you have actually identified the correct plant. So you collect those. And this time, you're going to use them fresh. So you can soak them fresh in your oil and put them in the sun for at least two weeks. And they will ferment a little bit. And the red color is actually going to come out. And as it does, it looks like this, quite beautiful. So this is St. John's Wort oil. And that's excellent, especially for nerve pain. So any injuries or any pain associated with nerve damage, St. John's Wort is excellent for that. You may know Hypericum, the homeopathic, for nerve pain, right? But this is, this is the oil made with the whole plant. And that you can use for massage if you have lower back pain or any rheumatic pains or um, shingles or um, any um, pinched nerve injury and things like that, you can, you can use that oil. So here is the material and here is how it sits on the windowsill. I actually like to expose it to sunshine. So I actually keep it open under the sun. And it ferments a little bit so it's best in the summer for sure. Yeah, because that's when you have the fresh material anyways because you are working with the fresh plants. You are not working with dried. You can work with dried, but it's better to work with flesh in this scenario, in this case. And then again, you strain it, and here is your ready St. John's Wort oil.
Now, you don't have to do it only with St. John's wort or only with calendula. You can make, actually make culinary oils that way as well. And that is my last sample. So this is oil that is made with cayenne pepper, dry cayenne pepper. And I have a little bit of rosemary and some garlic slices in there just for fun. It makes great Christmas gifts your homemade um, Christmas gift. And it's quite hot, it's a great condiment. Cayenne is one of the spices that really warms you up through and through. If you feel cold coming on, hot foot bath with cayenne in is one of the best answers for that because that really warms up the body instantaneously. Because usually colds are due to the cold influence, right? So when we do feel cold like that, that's one of the best ways to actually deal with that right away. So um, in the winter, we also want to warm up uh, the foods by those hot spices. So we can actually use the cayenne oil to do that. And um, if you make that, this is going to last more than a year because it's really spicy. I use actually um, cayenne um, that I got from a friend uh, from Cambodia. So it's extremely hot. <laughs> and in that case, you actually use the dry cayenne. And just like for the calendula flowers, let it soak in for two weeks or so, and then put it in a blender and blend it up. Put it in a mason jar. The solids are going to settle on the bottom, and on top you will, you will have beautiful red infused oil. You can do that with rosemary as well. You can add actually dried garlic slices and dried rosemary right in there, and you have beautiful flavored, uh, fragrant hot oil that you can use as a condiment. But if you have rheumatic pains, you can actually rub it on your knee or um, on your joints and whatever, right? Because that again is going to warm up the area and increase circulation in that area. Mm -hmm.